and turn over to hymn number 75. Hymn number 75. Number 30, nothing but the blood. Nothing but 
Jimmy, could you please ask the blessing over the offering this morning? Heavenly Father, we come before you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for all that you do for us. We thank you, Lord, for your unending, unfailing love for us. We thank you, Lord, for showing us just how much you love us by shedding your blood and giving your life on the cross, Lord, to pay our debt for our sin. We thank you, Lord, that your grace is greater than our sin. Lord, your word tells us that man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord. We pray, Lord, you'll help us to have a hunger for your word here today. Help us, Lord, to align our hearts with your word and with your will. Help us, Lord, just to trust and obey, for there truly is no other way. We pray, Lord, that the lost will be obedient to the calling of your Holy Spirit today, that they may receive that gift of salvation that you freely offer. We pray, Lord, that all we do and say here today will be pleasing to you. We ask, Lord, to take this off and bless it. Multiply it, use it for your kingdom work. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you. May be seated. The Bible said a virgin would conceive, and she did. The Bible said in a manger he would lay. And he did. The Bible said he would suffer for our sin. And in three days he would rise again. And he did. So if he said he's coming back again, I have no reason to doubt. He'll return with the trump of God and we'll leave here with a shout. Everything Jesus said he'd do has come to pass. So if he says he's coming back, I have no doubt. Jesus said, take up thy bed and walk, and he did. Jesus said to Lazarus, you come forth, and he did. Jesus said, if you'll trust only in my name, I will save you by grace and i know he did so if he says he's coming back again i have no reason to doubt he'll return with the trump of god and we'll leave here with a shout everything jesus said he has come to pass so if he said he's coming back i have no doubt everything jesus said he'd do has come to pass so if he said he's coming back i have no doubt I have no doubt.
Hymn number 56. And after the first verse, the choir will come down and we'll go around and greet each other and welcome each other to the house of the Lord this morning.
Hymn number 127. Hymn number 127. seated it and turn over one page to 129 129 George has a special for us this morning. George, you come.
me Sweet home for the happy and free Sweet haven of rest for the weary How beautiful heaven must be Let's take your Bibles this morning and go to the book of Acts, chapter number 9. The book of Acts, chapter number 9. <clears throat> if it sounds familiar, we were here in January. <clears throat> so if you weren't here in January, it won't sound familiar. But Acts, chapter number 9, different spot, different spot. I mean, we're kind of picking up where we left off, so to speak. But uh, before we had been looking at Ananias a little bit, we're going to switch our direction somewhat. So Acts chapter number 9, and we'll begin in verse number 17. If you're able, I'll invite you to stand with me as we honor the reading of God's Word. Once you find your place, <clears throat> Acts chapter 9, and then verse number 17. It says, And Ananias went his way, and entering into the house, he putting his hands on him, talking about uh, Saul who became Paul. He said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest, has sent me that thou mightest receive thy sight, and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And immediately there fell from his eyes, as it had been scales, and he received sight forthwith, and arose, and was baptized. And when he had received meat, he was strengthened. Then was Saul certain days with the disciples which were at Damascus. And straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues, that he is the Son of God. But all that heard him were amazed, and said, Is not this he that destroyed them, which called on his name in Jerusalem, and came hither for that intent, that he might bring them bound unto the chief priests? But Saul increased the more in strength, and confounded the Jews which dwelt at Damascus, proving that this is very Christ. And after that many days were fulfilled, the Jews took counsel to kill him. But their laying await was known of Saul, and they watched the gates day and night to kill him. Then the disciples took him by night, and led him down by the wall in a basket. And then Saul was come to Jerusalem. He essayed to join himself to the disciples, but they were afraid of him, and believed not that he was a disciple. I want to bring our message <clears throat> this morning of a basket case. A basket case. Amen. <laughs> Let's pray. Father, once again, we just want to thank you for the great privilege of being in your house. Lord, we're thankful for all the songs that have been sung, the special music, the way it prepares our hearts, Lord, for the way that you preserve your word. 
that we have the opportunity to be able to look upon it in this day. Father, I pray that you would give us good understanding and help us to, to draw close to you, to understand how much that we depend upon you. We just want to thank you and praise you for it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. Please do be seated. I've always been intrigued by that verse number 25. It says, Then the disciples took him by night and led him down uh, by the wall in a basket. Seems like such a little random detail, doesn't it? Uh, I, I would I think it would have been sufficient to be able to say that they uh, that Paul escaped. You know, they, they let Paul out the back door. You know, something like that or, or, or whatever. But the Holy Spirit saw fit for us to know that he was let down uh, by the wall in a basket. And uh, he gave testimony himself in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. He was talking about that same event. And, and it, again, Paul didn't just say, he's like, well, you know, I, I was able to escape. They were coming for me. I mean, he had to, he had to make the confession. He says, they let me down with, with a basket. That basket was important. And so I started thinking on that and just kind of reading and studying about it. And, and I started thinking about that. You know, he was the, he was the first basket case in Scripture. <laughs> and by, I started looking it up. So by definition, I thought it's pretty interesting, a basket case. It says, one that is in a completely hopeless situation and one that is made powerless or ineffective, usually by nerves, panic, or stress. You know, the story is that uh, that that term basket case was first used in the First World War. And, I, and it was talking about those that were wounded in battle to the degree uh, uh, arms and, and legs or eyes, they, they couldn't uh, take care of themselves. So they were transported from the field in a basket. That's why they were called a basket case. And so the point was they were totally dependent upon somebody else. And whenever I started thinking about that, I thought, you know, that's exactly how the Apostle Paul was. He was saved on that road to Damascus, and, and, uh, and he began to learn that matter of dependence and what it was that was taking place. Now, back up in chapter number 9, let's look at it real quick, in case it's new to you. Uh, chapter 9, verse number 1 says, And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went unto the high priest, and desired of them letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if, any, uh, that if he found any of this way, talking about those followers of Jesus, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a, a light from heaven. And he fell to the earth, and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It's hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise, and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no man, but they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was there three days without sight, and neither did eat nor drink." So while Paul uh, still had some physical abilities, and you think about this, he's in a whole new course of life in which he was going to be utterly dependent upon somebody other than himself. Even whenever he regained his sight, remember that's where Ananias comes in. Look down real quick to verse number uh, 17. Ananias went his way and entering into the house, this is after he argued with the Lord. He said, Lord, are you sure? You know, and uh, so he went into the house, he says, putting his hands on him and said, Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way as thou comest, have sent me, that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. And immediately there fell from his eyes as it had been scales, and he received sight forthwith and arose and was baptized. So even whenever he regained his sight, uh, you think about this, Saul is still in some uncharted uh, territory. He didn't really know what, uh, what was going on. Uh, he had just left the Lord uh, on the road, I'm sorry, he had just met the Lord on the road to Damascus, and in a matter of just, uh, you know, a few days, he's gone to the point where he is blind, restored his sight, uh, he was uh, baptized, and, and, and think about those that he was set on destroying are the people that he's most associated with. You talk about your whole world being changed. I don't know about you, I would imagine uh, that the Apostle Paul was just a little bit nervous right then. When you open up your eyes and you look around, you are in the wrong territory, you know? And, and so uh, he's got a lot that he's certainly got to be able to, uh, to process. Uh, it was well known and stated in verse number 21 that he started his trip to Damascus with the intent of destroying those that called upon the name of Jesus. And now he's one that calls upon the name of Jesus. Boy, what a change. Just a matter of a moment. 
His whole life had changed. A matter of a moment, he switched sides. In a matter of a moment, he had whole new roles and responsibilities. His whole identity was changed. He goes from being Saul of Tarsus to the Apostle Paul. First time that we see that name Paul that's used in Acts chapter 13 whenever he's, he's being sent out on the missionary journeys. But, but even already, God has changed his life. Man, there's been a dramatic change. Now, that doesn't mean that there's no uh, struggles here for for Paul, certainly not. Uh, every Christian finds out whenever you're saved, you're still not perfect. Amen? We, uh, we all have that inner battle that's going on. We've got the old man versus the new man that's constant and wage, uh, raging against us. Whenever we uh, receive Jesus as Savior, you've got the Holy Spirit that comes and lives within us. Our sin debt is paid. And from God's vantage point, you think about it, He's like, man, that, that's my child. Amen? Uh, we're under the blood of Jesus. But the only way that we'll be victorious in our spiritual battles is to yield to the power of God rather than trying to struggle about life in our own strength. And that's where the big battle really, uh, really lies. That's where uh, so many Christians struggle. It's like, I, you know, I just don't know what to do. And we're struggling and fighting and, and, and getting all discouraged rather than letting God lead and, and follow in the direction that He goes. Uh, that struggle, it doesn't, uh, it's there because following Following God's direction doesn't always come naturally. It's one of those things we kind of, we're having to learn how to yield. We live the Christian life the same way that we started the Christian life. It's by faith, by faith. And so Paul gives us a good reminder that there's going to be some things that we need to consider whenever we embark uh, on a new course in life. Whenever we're following after the Lord, there's a lot of things we're going to have to consider. Uh, how do you prepare for the unknown? How do you prepare for those things? How do you make sure that you're actually going the right way in life? How do you make sure that you have the provisions that are needed to finish what you start? The Bible's clear about that. He says, man, you're supposed to sit down and count the cost. Make sure that you're going to able, uh, be able to finish. What about the people that you have with you? Do they have the same values? Do they see the significance of the time at hand? We have to look at all of those things. And all of this is coming to fruition as you start a new course in life. And that's what you've got here of Saul of Tarsus. He's starting a new course in life. And this is a very powerful passage whenever you start looking at these details. First of all, what did he need? He needed nourishment. He needed nourishment. Look down to verse number 19. It says, And when he had received meat, he was strengthened. He received meat, and then he was strengthened. Uh, there's a lot going on really in that verse, uh, much more than just the meat. Well, wonder what kind of meat it was, amen? Uh, Paul is learning that God is able to meet the physical needs as well as the spiritual needs. He's learning how it is that God provides. Uh, he didn't have to go catch fish, amen? He didn't have to bake his own bread. Somebody helped him. Somebody helped him to be able to, to gain what it was that was needed. Uh, God does that, and he can use any means possible. Amen. Things that you didn't even think were possible. It's possible with God. You remember Elijah? Elijah was told there was going to be the big three-year drought that was going to be happening. And, and God told him, he says, get to the brook Kareth. And you get to the brook Kareth, he says, I'll take care of you. And remember what he did? He was able to drink out of the brook. But it said there was a raven that brought him meat and bread twice a day. That's pretty amazing. I don't think I'd ever get over that one. You know, I, I mean, I have never seen a crow or a raven, a meat-eating bird that, that says, you want to share? It's like, I just, you know, that's, that's not the way that they are, they are programmed at all. And yet Elijah had to make that determination. He says, am I going to trust God or not? And so in 1 first, first Kings 17 verse 5 it says, so he went and did according unto the Lord. You know, that's the first lesson that we really have to learn. Amen? Just go and do according to the Lord. Trust him. He trusted God at his word. And after all, uh, think about it. Uh, God is also the creator of the raven. Amen. Isn't it interesting? Whenever Jesus was speaking in Luke 12, he said, consider the ravens. I like that. Amen. He didn't, he didn't you know, uh, consider the bald eagle. He said, consider the ravens. He said, they neither sow nor reap, neither, uh, which, uh, which neither have storehouse nor barn, and God feedeth them. How much more are ye better than the fowls? He said, consider those ravens. He says, man, they're not out there planting the garden so that they can grow some corn and come eat the corn. He said, God fed them. Now, whenever you think about that, uh, Jesus is saying, uh, make sure you consider the ravens. Elijah is saying, all, all right, well, I'm being fed by the ravens. Is he really being fed by the ravens? No, he's being fed by God. God's the one taking care of the ravens, and, the ravens are, and God's using those ravens to take care 
of Elijah. That's just the instrument that God uses. You know, uh, we may not have our provision by a raven today, but whenever we start looking at how it is that God provides, how does God meet a need, uh, how does God do that, uh, you know what He does? Whatever he wants. Amen? But listen, he can make the way. There will be ways that are met that, that sometimes it's a direct relation because he gives you the ability and strength to be able to do the work, to be able to, to provide for the need. Sometimes there's a special need. Sometimes there's things that hit your home and your life and you don't know what in the world that you're going to do. And all you can do is just follow God. I'm just going to be faithful with God. I'm just going to trust in what it is that God wants me to do. And you know what? He says, okay. Think about Elijah. Elijah wouldn't have been fed if he hadn't gone to the brook Kareth. That was the only thing that he was done. He said, just get there. Get to the brook. I'll take care of the rest. Imagine if he says, I just don't see that working. I don't like the brook Kareth. I've been to that brook before. Dirty little brook. He didn't do that. Amen. He says, is that what God said? That's what I'll do. And then God met the need. Uh, your needs are met by your faithfulness to God. Vance Havner He's an old, old preacher. I love listening to him, uh, but I'm pretty slow. And so I've got to like hit pause a lot. If you ever listen to a sermon, I like reading it better because I get a chance to, you know, sit there. But it's like every word's kind of this profound statement. He was, uh, he was saved early. I think he started preaching when he was 13. He'd take a little wagon ride to, uh, to the different places and preaching these little towns all around him and everything. And, and uh, just a little country preacher, but just had some great statements. But he, he would often make a statement. He said, you'll never learn that Christ is all you need until Christ is all you have. It's very true. Saul had a group of men with him whenever he started his trip. He had all these, these guys that are with him whenever that light shined around about him in the noonday and, and, uh, and they, you know, and, and is giving their testimony. They didn't know what was going on. Uh, guess what? None of those guys that were with him were able to restore his sight. None of those guys that were with him were able to give him some helpful insight about what it meant to follow Jesus. They were on the other side. They couldn't help him, amen? They were going to say, well, I'll tell you what, Saul. This is what you need to do. Let me, let me get you on board with following Jesus here. You know, one of the joys of the disciples was having Jesus so close to him. Hey, Ben? Remember whenever he was in the boat, whenever he was in the boat, they got to figure out that, uh, that Jesus had, the, uh, had the, the presence and the provision to be able to meet their needs. They could just, just go to him, and, 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 and that's whenever they learned that he was the master of the sea, and, and what manner of man does the, the winds and the waves actually obey him? Saul would come to know that as well. He'd come to understand the closeness of the Lord. That's what he later penned in Ephesians 2 and, and verse 13. He says, But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. So Paul could say, I know that one firsthand. I used to be so far off, but I was made nigh by the blood of Christ. Saul also learned that God uses people. He uses people. Uh, imagine the importance of that. Certainly that was important for Saul. Amen? Uh, the man that can't see, the man that's got no food, uh, all those type of things. It was great whenever uh, he was uh, able to receive meat. Somebody was able to help contribute to his nourishment. Can I tell you, it was also beneficial for those that brought food to Saul. Saul's not the only identifier here. As much as we uh, honor the life of the Apostle Paul for all the writings and all the contributions to the church and all that, he wasn't the only one in the church. Every person plays a part. Can you imagine what it would mean to have Saul of Tarsus on the pew beside you? Can you imagine him walking in the door? That's what it says in verse 26 after he's already uh, let down and escapes. Verse 26 says, when Saul came to Jerusalem, he essayed to join himself to the disciples. But they were all afraid of him and believed not that he was a disciple. What a, what a great day. Hey, guys, I've been looking for you. Ah! Yeah, man, they're running. It would be pretty tempting to skip service if you knew that Saul was about to walk in the door and sit on your pew. Amen. Look what it says back up in verse number 13. It says, Ananias answered. Remember, the Lord told Ananias, he says, hey, uh, go on into town. You're going to find Saul there. And, uh, and Ananias answered. He says, Lord, I've heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to thy saints at Jerusalem. And here he hath authority by the chief priest to, to bind all that call upon his name. Man, Ananias wasn't buying it. He was like, Lord, man, I, you know, maybe you hadn't heard. But, but this, is, this is a pretty rough guy. Everybody was unsure of Saul. By the way, as well they should be. Amen? That's called common sense. And yet, you still face the fact that Saul here needs to eat. He needs to have some provision. They're probably over there casting lots. Who's going to take him to Del Rio after service? <laughs> Amen. It's a great work to be able to reconcile sinners to each other. 
It's a great work that can only be done by the Lord Himself. It'd be quite the indicator of the, the love that man has toward God whenever you see how it is that man would be able to meet the needs of somebody like Saul of Tarsus. 1 John chapter 3, verse 16 and 17, he says, Hereby perceive we the love of God, because He laid down His life for us. And then it says, And we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoso hath this world's good, and seeth his brother have need, and shutteth up his, his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? Afterward, Saul and those of Damascus, they're going to have, they're going to have a strong, lasting bond of fellowship. Can you imagine what it would be like whenever you recognize that Saul of Tarsus just got saved? Wow, what a great, great thing that's going on. And so, uh, God meets the needs of a basket case through nourishment, and He brings it all together through good Christian fellowship. It's amazing what God puts together. And for the new course in life, secondly, there was something else that Paul needed. He needed to contribute. It, it wasn't just a matter of what it is that he's taken in. He's also got to be given out. Amen? It's amazing how that was just laid on him right there from the beginning. He needed to be a, a part of what was going on. Verse number 19, it says, When he had received meat, he was strengthened. Then was Saul certain days with the disciples which were at Damascus. So, a new course in life, uh, you know, that can be a, a difficult transition time. It's one thing to, uh, to be together, but, but what do you do with what you have? I mean, how do you learn to, what, how are you going to put it into practice? What, do you, what is it that God wants you to do? It didn't take Paul long to be able to figure out that he had a method. He had something that he could contribute. And on top of that, he had a desire to do the contribution. Look at what it says, very next verse there in verse number 20. Straightway, that means immediately, right after. So, and straightway he preached Christ in the synagogues that he is the Son of God. That's a pretty big first step, Amen. I mean, he, he didn't say, well, you know, maybe guys, if there's something you could do, I, I, I can make some tents or something, you know. I mean, he didn't do it. He said, straight away, he goes into the synagogue. He starts preaching. Amen. His first sermon, how to have your best life now. No, no, not really. He preached about Jesus. Jesus. He preached that he is the Son of God. Of all the years that Saul had denied Jesus, now he made sure that everybody knew whose side that he was on. He made sure that there was no mistaking what it was that was so very important. There would be a day where, where Paul would uh, pen letters to the churches and give instruction about what is to take place and their functions and the purpose. There's times that he's going to go to the philosophers and he's going uh, to preach to those philosophers and scholars in Athens. He's going to stand before heads of state, heads of country. He's going to do all of those things. He's going to spend years getting closer to the Lord by studying through the Scriptures before he even gets started on his public ministry. But in that day at Damascus, he made the greatest confession that would be the cornerstone of the rest of his life. And for his whole ministry, he was proclaiming the deity of Jesus Christ. He's saying Jesus is the Son of God. What a great topic. You know, whenever you know the deity of Christ, and you know the humanity of man and the desperate need of man, you know, uh, it, it, whenever you know those things, you understand that man is still sinful. That man has something that is, that is necessary in life. And, and that's what Paul is doing. Paul's addressing their needs. He didn't go there to say, let me tell you how to better fulfill the rites and rituals. He says, let me tell you about the one who fulfilled it all to perfection. Let me tell you about the one who, who, who took it upon himself. Let me tell you about the one who died in my place. Let me tell you the one who of all the sin that I've ever done. And boy, Saul could make a list and he says, of all of those things, and, and he says, I misrepresented the Lord. I, I didn't receive him the way that he was supposed to be. Uh, so many times I was told about his deity, and I just discounted it. But, but there was a day that I came face to face with Jesus. And he says, I can attest to you that he is the Son of God. He is the one that changed my life. You know, that's what the Jews had missed, wasn't it? That's what we've been studying about in the, in the Gospel of John on Sunday nights. We've been able to go through and, and all through those miracles, all through that life and, and that accounting of what it was that, that uh, the Gospel of John records for us. Remember, uh, underlying it all, there's this representation of the spiritual need of the Jews. Just how much that they were lacking, how much that they missed out on, how much that they denied His very deity. So much so that whenever Jesus made that statement in John chapter 10 where he says, I and my Father are one, they reached down and picked up stones 
And they were about to stone him. And yet Paul, Saul, preaches about Jesus. And it says in verse number 22 that it confounded the Jews. It confounded. Look at what it says. Verse 21 says, uh, But all that heard him were amazed and said, Is not this he that destroyed them? which called on his name in Jerusalem, and came hither for that intent, that he might bring them bound unto the chief priests. But Saul increased the more in strength, and confounded the Jews which dwelt at Damascus, proving that this is very Christ. I love it. All that heard him were amazed. They were not just confounded, just, they were not just confounded at Paul. Amen. They, they weren't looking and saying, well, look at that. Here's, here's Saul of Tarsus. They weren't just, you know, confounded that it's Saul that's preaching. They're confounded about Jesus. They're confounded at the fact that, that Jesus, this very Son of God, the one who is deity, could actually save somebody like Saul of Tarsus. That would confound them. That was the power of his testimony. That was his contribution. Listen, at this point, uh, Saul is not, he's not the Apostle Paul. He hasn't gone on the missionary trips. He hadn't done all of those things. But he knows who it was that made a change in the life, in his life. You know, whenever you start thinking about what it means to be able to uh, have a new life in Christ, you know, it's amazing what God does because he says, I'll give you something to contribute. A lot of times as people, we say, I just don't think I've got anything to give. I don't think I've got any contribution. Do you have a testimony? Can you, can you share what Jesus did for you? Because that's what somebody is needing to hear at this time. For a new course in life, he needed nourishment. He needed to contribute. And thirdly, he needed humility. He needed humility. And that brings up this matter of the basket that got this whole thing started. Now, look at what he says in verse number 25. It says, Then the disciples took him by night and led him down by the wall in a basket. Let me just tell you, there are no random words in Scripture. Amen. Why would they use a basket? Why would they do that? Why not just let him down with a rope? Why couldn't it be? I, I mean, you want to be all scriptural and everything. You know, this would be a great picture, wouldn't it? They let him down with a scarlet thread. <laughs> hey, it happened with the spies. Amen. Man, that would have been awesome. But he didn't. It wasn't by a rope. Why didn't they have a wagon going out and cover him with hay like in the Old West? <laughs> right? I mean, that's what, that's what they always did to be able to get somebody out of town. Daniel Boone. Why didn't they just cover him up with some straw? But he didn't. They, they let him down with a, with a basket. So I think a basket, in my mind, somebody letting a basket down from a wall, that would kind of gather my attention. You know, I would say, that's kind of out of the ordinary. That doesn't seem quite right. So I began to study the, that word basket in Scripture. That's fun stuff, eh, Amen. So I started looking up all the times that the Bible spoke about a basket. And it didn't take long. Go back with me real quick to Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter number 26. <clears throat> Keep your spot. We'll be back. But I want you to be able to see this. Pretty interesting. So in Deuteronomy, uh, what's going on here, Moses is preparing uh, the children of Israel to be able to go into the promised land. They've been wandering in the wilderness. And remember, uh, the promised land is not a picture of heaven. Amen? Uh, whenever you go to heaven, you're not going to have to fight the enemy and throw them out. Amen? And so, uh, but, but what is it? Uh, whenever you see the promised land, it's a picture of the victorious Christian life. That's what it is that every Christian should uh, have. And so Moses himself, he's not even allowed to go into the promised land. Uh, but he is making the preparations. He's making sure that the rest of them knew just how important that it was. And he was telling them, uh, whenever you get there, he says, let me tell you what you need to do. He says, you need to make a, a, a first fruits offering to the Lord. What was it? Uh, it was a one-time gift that was to remind them that whenever they go into the promised land, they're going to be reaping the benefits of something that they didn't do. They were going to be living in houses that they didn't build. They're going to be casting out the enemy, right? They're going to be eating from the crops and gardens that they didn't plant. They're going to be living in abundance from the very gracious hand of God. He's the one who is providing it. And so whenever you get to Deuteronomy 26, he's saying, so whenever you get there, he says, you need to be making this first fruits offering. Now look at what he says in chapter 26, verse number 1. He's going to talk about this offering. Chapter 26 of Deuteronomy, verse number 1. And it shall be, when thou art come in... <clears throat> unto the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance, and possess it, and dwellest 
therein. That thou shalt uh, take of the first of all the fruit of the earth, which thou shalt bring of thy, of thy land, that the Lord thy God giveth thee. He says, uh, God's the one who provided all this for you. He says, you're going to take that fruit of the land, now watch this, and shall put it in a basket. Isn't that interesting? You should, you should be saying, yeah, man, that's incredible. So, so here it is. They got this first fruits offering. Put it in a bag. Why not just put it in a tray? Why, why don't you just bring it in a bag? He said, put it in a basket and shall go into the place which the Lord thy God shall choose to place his name there. And thou shalt go unto the priests that shall be in those days, and say unto him, I profess this day unto the Lord thy God, that I am come unto the country which the Lord swear unto our fathers for to give us. And the priest, watch this, shall take the basket out of thine hand and set it down before the altar of the Lord thy God. Their offering, they're coming, first fruits offering, first in the land. They're taking it in a basket. Now, Keep on going down to the end. Go down to verse number 18. It says, <clears throat> uh, starting verse 17. Thou hast avouched the Lord this day to be thy God. Now, what does that mean to avouch? It means to, to affirm in the most sober manner. To affirm in the most sober manner manner. The Lord this day to be thy God, and to walk in his ways, and to keep his statutes, and his commandments, and his judgments, and to hearken unto his voice. This was a great pledge that was going on. Look at verse 18. It says, And the Lord hath avouched thee this day to be his peculiar people, in also the most sober manner. He is affirming, he says, this is my, isn't it interesting, peculiar people. As he hath promised thee, and that thou shouldest keep all his commandments, watch this in verse number 19, and to make thee, so whenever you see in verse 19, he says the reason for all of his instruction was because this is what it was that God desired, to make thee high above all nations, which he hath made in praise and in name and in honor, and that thou mayest be a holy people unto the Lord thy God, as he hath spoken." There's a personal sig significance to all this. He says, he says, I want you to recognize that you are to be a holy nation. You're to be a reverenced people. You're to, you're to be separate from all the other nations. And he says, uh, that was the reason, that was the, the, the reason for that first fruits offering. It was acknowledging God. He was the one who made it all possible. He was the one who opened up the promised land. They would have never known it. They'd still be in the wilderness if it wasn't for what it is that he was doing. And so whenever they were making that offering, they were like, this is, and this is what Moses said. He said, the first thing that you need to do whenever you recognize how incredible it is that the Almighty God has taken care of you is to take that offering and, and put it in a basket let it be a reminder of your obedience. He goes through in chapter number 28, you can read it, it's pretty much the whole chapter. But, but he goes through and he says uh, that the, uh, if there's going to be obedience to the commandments of God, there's go he says you'll be a blessed people. You'll be a blessed people. And he says if you're not observing God, you'll be a cursed people. Now notice what he says here. Uh, he's going through, well, look in chapter 28. <clears throat> and he's talking about uh, the blessings. It, it, let's just read it. Verse number one, it says, And it shall come to pass, if thou shalt hearken diligently unto the Lord thy God, to observe and to do all his commandments, which I command thee this day, that the Lord thy God will set thee on high above all nations of the earth. And all these blessings shall come on thee and overtake thee, if thou shalt hearken to the voice of the Lord thy God. Blessed shalt thou be in the city, and blessed shalt thou be in the field. Blessed shalt be the fruit of thy body, and the fruit of thy ground, and the fruit of thy cattle, and the increase of thy kind, and the flocks of the sheep. Now watch this in verse 5. Blessed shall be thy basket in thy store. It was, I mean, he says, your offering in that basket. He says, you have a blessed basket. Right after that, he goes through all the, the cursings. He says, if you're going to live in disobedience, you're not going to obey the things of God. He says, guess what? He goes down to verse number 17. He says, cursed shall be thy basket and all thy store. And it was all according to their choice. How are they going to honor God? The children of Israel serve as a reminder of what the believer is supposed to be today. And the heart of Christ is the same for us. He wants us to be a peculiar people set apart, bringing glory to His name. 
1 Peter chapter 2 and verse number 9 it says, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of Him who hath called you out of darkness into His marvelous light. That's the same thing He told the Israelites whenever they were going into the promised land. He said, that's who it is that you are supposed to be. You're supposed to be a holy nation. And that's what he wanted from the Apostle Paul as well. And so I find it interesting of all the ways that Paul could have been delivered from the city. Now that he's saved, he's baptized, he's got fellowship, he's got a mission, he's got a calling, and now all of a sudden he's in a basket. And he's starting his walk. Pretty interesting. What an offering to be able to give if you can give yourself. If you can give yourself. Beyond all the fulfillment of the great picture of all the offering of life that should be uh, there, it serves another purpose. Do you know how humbling it would be to have to climb into a basket? This was the man who commanded fear. He commanded fear everywhere that he went. And now, he's a basket case. That's exactly what he is. He's in a hopeless situation. He is totally dependent upon others. Somebody else is holding the rope. Amen? A lot of trust if you're the one in the basket. <laughs> you, there's certain people you'd probably look at and you're like, not you. I'll take this guy. I want the one that's paying attention to detail. You know, the one that brought his gloves when you started <laughs> lowering me down. You know, not the tender-handed guy. <laughs> oh! There's nothing you can do from the inside of a basket. You know, Paul was going to need that lesson if he was going to have a life of serving God. Paul stood the chance of having a lot of pride. A lot of pride in all of his knowledge and understanding. And it could serve as a great hindrance for what it was that God wanted to accomplish. He later mentions, he says, I was the Hebrew of the Hebrews. I was of the tribe of Benjamin as, as touching the law of Pharisee. Man, he had all the pedigree. It would be easy for Paul to begin to think of all the things that he could do in his own name and in his own power and his own might, no own craftiness to be able to do God's business. But if that was the case, any effort that he would ever give would just come short. It would never accomplish God's will. He could certainly fail. Paul needed to find himself in a spot of utter dependence upon the Lord. That's where he needed to be. In the same position that he was in whenever that light shone around about him and he was face down in the dirt on the road to Damascus, that was the position that he needed to maintain every day of his life as he followed the Lord. When you're charting your own course in life, a new course in life, never move beyond your dependence on the Lord. It all depends on Him. He is the power that sustains your very life. Be yielded to Him. He's got a perfect plan in mind. He's got a great work that's going. He's seeing people saved, following the Lord. He's going to use you to accomplish that will. Be encouraged in what it is that God is doing and make sure that you're depending on Him. That was the beginning. That was the beginning of the life of a basket case. And every one of us have that same dependence on the Lord today. Every one of us need to be depending on Him. You may be here, maybe you've never received Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. You know, you can come to Christ, you can ask Him to forgive you of your sins, be your personal Savior. You can put all of your trust and hope in Him and Him alone. His finished work at Calvary, He'll save you. There may be something that you need to surrender to the Lord, maybe a direction that you need to follow. Maybe something that you just need to bring to Him that say, I can't do it. Can't do it. One of the greatest confessions that you'll ever make is to be able to say, I can't do it. But God can. God can work. You can trust Him. Let's all stand together. We'll have a hymn of invitation. Our Heavenly Father, thank You for allowing us the privilege of being able to look through Your Word and <clears throat> see the truths that are given to us in Scripture. Thank You, Father, for helping us to be able to see our need of being able to just align ourselves with Your will. Father, if there's one here that doesn't know Christ as Savior, they've never come face to face with Jesus, and humbled Himself. Lord, I pray, Father, that today would be the day of salvation. And I pray, Lord, that each of us would have a desire to put You first in all things. Lord, to follow Your direction, Your leadership. Lord, the more that we do of our own selves, the more of a mess that we make of life. 
And yet we know that you are doing a perfect work. So I pray, Father, that you would find us yielded to you. Thank you for your grace and goodness. And we pray, Father, that you would get the glory of this time of invitation. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Amen. Number 250. 250. If you need to come pray, won't you? Pray as we begin to sing. Need to be saved. Why don't you come forward now? Days are filled with sorrow.